discussing his live today with Amanda Hahn uh, from Keystone CBA. She is the absolute ninja in all things tax related with uh, real estate investing. She has a book out on Bigger Pockets. She's a huge name over there, and I've worked with Amanda for years on tax uh, for a number of uh, clients here at Royal Legal Solutions. So it's my pleasure to uh, bring Amanda onto the show today. Um, if you're here in, your, in our watch party, that's part of our, our group uh, here, you're gonna be hearing this presentation live. If you're here on the podcast, I, I, I encourage you to be able to come and do these, uh, attend these presentations uh, live with our watch parties um, that we have with our expert guests, with these recorded calls, uh, with my attorney staff uh, in here answering questions for us as we go through the presentations. It's an extreme amount of education in a very short amount of time, and it's designed intentionally to be that way. So if you're hearing this online, join in on the watch parties, connect with us to the royallegalsolutions.com website and get plugged in on how you can attend uh, these shows. So Amanda, the absolute CPA ninja from Keystone CPA. Um, tell us a little bit about like what things are important um, for people to know, because as you know, we're all real estate investors. We're on the path to financial freedom here um, inside of this group through our real estate investing. Um, and I'm just curious, Amanda, where do you see yourself inside of the, the journey that real estate investors have when they're looking to get through their financial freedom in real estate investing? Yeah, well, first off, uh, thank you so much for having me. And I want to say hello to everybody here. This is my first uh, watch party. I'm super excited to be here. Um, uh, so, I mean, in terms of what my role is in uh, for real estate investors, um, uh, just a little bit about me. I'm a real estate investor myself. One of the reasons that um, I got into real estate investing is actually for the tax benefits of it. Um, earlier in my career, what I did was to help other people save taxes using real estate. Some point realized, hey, this is something I should do for myself as well. Um, so yeah, having a team together, you know, as a real estate investor, um, having a team together to kind of bring all the different pieces, I think is super important. Um, and I'm also happy to be here too, because, you know, with the clients we work with, probably one of the most frequently asked questions are what kind of legal entity should I be? And then we always say, hey, you got to bring in an attorney. And I know for you, Scott, you probably get it all the time where people say, hey, what about this and that? And you say, well, you need to go ask your CPA. So it's so awesome that we're both here and, you know, they can ask us questions at the same time. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, the way I look at it is, you know, every dollar saved in taxes is maybe four or $5 more that you can invest in real estate. So if you can save $20,000 in taxes per year, that could be a down payment on another property that you buy for $100,000. So a very, very impactful uh, piece of the puzzle when you're trying to reach financial freedom. Yeah, I mean, it's huge, right? Like the number one thing that we have to do, right, is increase our top line revenue. And after we increase top line revenue, it's defense, isn't it? Um, like how many dollars can you save off expenses? How many dollars can you save off of taxes? And then ultimately that gives you total dollars left to invest. And those are your soldiers. You got to put those to work, getting those motivated inside of the right investments. And when you get that all working, then you're able to get on faster on the track to financial freedom. And the biggest savings I've seen people make is one is getting tightened up on the expenses. People always seem to spend more money than they think in their mind. If you ask somebody, how, what are your expenses? A lot of people say, I don't know. Yeah. And to me, I'm always like, whoa, 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 whoa. How do you not know what your expenses are if you're on, if you're committed to increasing the amount of money you have invested into it? And the second thing is, is what, what is your tax? What's your effective tax rate after we get into it? So I know a lot of people are out there like, well, my tax, I'm, you know, I make $150,000 a year. My, my effective tax rate is north of 30%. Uh, of what they pay. And when I usually see like those kinds of things, I was, I was like, wow, that there must be a really good reason that you're effect, you're paying so much in taxes. Like you must be really limited on your strategies. And most of the time that's actually not the case. It's just because they haven't considered uh, a really like in-depth look of what are all of the options that are available to them. And I guess I was curious, Amanda, is like, what do you typically see with people um, coming into your office, like it, are those pretty clear numbers um, from your firm about like, hey, this is where most people come in and this is usually where they, you're able to get to if you're using some of the more advanced strategies? Yeah, I mean, it kind of differs because, um, you know, we work mo mainly with real estate investors, but we, we kind of, it's kind of through the gamut. We have people who all they do is real estate. 
those are typically the people who have very low tax rates and they might be still making a lot of cash flow and stuff, but a lot of strategies to reduce taxes. We also have people who are heavily W-2, maybe just starting out in real estate, uh, maybe just one rental to start off with. Um, typically, those are the people that are much higher tax rate and it takes, you know, maybe a year or two or three years of planning to really see a very significant shift you know, from a, a very high bracket down to a lower bracket. But it's interesting you say, you know, someone making 100 or 150,000 saying that they, you know, they pay 30% in taxes. A lot of times when I ask people how much they pay in taxes, they quantify that in, in, the, in terms of refunds that they get. And that's not a good way to look at it, right? Because you could be someone who, uh, you know, have, have a job and are withholding way too much. And by the end of the year, you get a huge refund and you think you're doing really great. But what's really important is to look at what is your true tax rate, like you were saying earlier, right? Your effective rate. How much did you actually pay in taxes based on your total income? Um, and then the other thing is people only look at federal income taxes. Um, <clears throat> so people that live in states that have higher tax, California, New York, um, you know, Illinois, <laughs> You know, that may be another, you know, up to 10% or more, right, on top of your federal income tax. And of course, we all pay, you know, property tax, payroll tax. So um, the uh, Tax Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization, came out and had indicated that the average American spends more money in taxes than they do on uh, clothing, food, and shelter. Right? And shelter is huge. That's like our mortgage, our rent. So, so we spend more in taxes than all three of those things combined. Uh, that's how much the average American is losing to taxes. Not us, though, as real estate investors, right? As the more we get into the real estate investor game, we're going to let everybody else pay all those taxes. Yeah, real estate <laughs> investors are never average. You know, uh, I think we're some of the most creative people that I meet. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, right? Always looking for the angle. Like, how do I structure this better? It's like yeah. the true entrepreneurs of the investing world as it comes into, right? And I think that's why I love real estate. And that's why I like working with, uh, I love working with real estate investors myself. It's because I just love that entrepreneurial spirit of like, how can we get through? And I know, and, and coaching people through the investing side of things, the way we've typically looked at uh, the way we structured things in World Legal Solutions is looking at, great, let's, let's get the foundations and the structures of your assets, right? You have the money. Now we have the money and the assets. Now we have the assets. Let's protect the assets, get the right infrastructure in place, uh, for uh, S corporations, series LLCs, DSCs, whatever the case may be, um, to use those. And then we'll look at, great, now we look at, okay, now let's proceed on to the tax of like, okay, what are the deductions we should be taking? You know, retirement accounts, um, you know, irrevocable life insurance trusts, et cetera. Like what are the, those other considerations that come through? And, and so in our kind of stages that we, we walk people through and ending with calls that are like this, which is what's your ongoing education and pulse on the market, uh, which we're also uh, bringing into to these shows. Um, and that and that first stage of the asset protection uh, come through. I know you're really familiar with the things that we do here at, at RLS, but I was wondering just in, in general terms if if you see like what are the 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 general strategies that people are are the general setups you see that people are using, and if and at what like income levels do you see people um, changing those strategies of like just the company infrastructure. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and again, that kind of runs the gamut. I sometimes come across investors who own, you know, a dozen rental properties all in their personal name. And I sort of have like a panic attack moment because no one <laughs> ever talked to them about uh, asset protection. Um, and then we have people who come to us really early in the game, you know, and they've learned from other investors to say, hey, I'm starting out now is the best time for me to get started correctly. So I'm not in a you know, the wrong entity, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a little bit, you know, what happens if you're in the wrong entity, a very painful and costly sometimes to unwind. But um, I think, uh, yeah, so for most of the investors we see, um, you know, that are doing it correctly, they're holding rentals in some sort of uh, flow through entity, right? Usually LLCs, uh, DSTs, or partnerships. Um, and from a tax perspective, that's really beneficial because, you know, as real estate investors, one of the biggest perks we get is the whole concept of deductions and depreciation. And so when we create these losses by maximizing, you know, our home office, our, our car expense, or we're shifting income to our kids, at the end of the day, we're trying to utilize those losses to offset other income we might have, whether it's like a W-2 income or, you know, capital gains from stocks. 
And so it's really important that on the entity structuring side that you have the right entity so that the losses are flowing through to you so you can use it to offset your personal taxes. Um, you know, in terms of like simplicity or complexity, um, you know, I just I usually leave that up to the, you know, the investor and their attorney, because, you know, that's kind of outside the realm of my expertise in terms of how many properties in one LLC and, you know, do you need like a holding entity? Um, but what I what I really like about what you do um, is to really try to simplify things, you know, because I, I, we've worked with some attorneys that just have very, very complex structures that result in a lot of tax returns, a lot of costs. Um, and those are things that I'm always looking out I for. Know, you know, because I think at the end of the day, for the investor, from the investor's perspective, what we really want is like the best asset protection with the lowest amount of cost like annual cost of maintenance. Um, because for me, you know, I don't want to charge someone to do a tax return unless it's absolutely necessary. So to the extent we can have entities that are, you know, what we consider disregarded, where they don't have to file a separate tax return, but they also provide the asset protection, uh, that's always my personal favorite. Yeah, to me, it makes the most sense because like it's keeping the eye on the ball, right? Which is total number of dollars I have left yeah. at the end of the year to invest, right? How so, much money am I, am I uh, keeping from all these investments, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Because that's like that's the goal, right? And like is the goal is like financial freedom, right? So it's dollars at the end of all of the calculus, right? It's not just saving on like, oh, my effective tax rate. It's also like how much did it cost me to prepare all these returns? To go with it how much money am i making you know like that's one of the things that i tell people is like hey well yeah you can do as corporations you can save on self-employment tax they're like well when can i do that it's like well technically speaking you can do that at any time when does it make sense to do it it's usually about at fifty fifty thousand dollars ish per year because it's the cost of the tax return you have to factor in with it and they're like oh i didn't realize yeah, yeah right because it's not just about tax right it's about the larger scope and that's why we typically talk about like cool let's walk through the gates and the stages yeah. of like what makes sense for us at, at where we where we get into so yeah. um so when we're talking about asset protection we're talking about series llc's llc's dst's s corporations um, as well as in some circumstances some types of c corporation strategies depending upon what the expenses might look like right like high education expenses medical expenses you know those kinds of things coming through um, i was wondering when some i just had a client the other day actually um that had um called me up and said hey listen i, I have a property i, I have a, a a series llc that i had formed through another uh a tax advisory company that wasn't a cpa into it they set me up with this structure I, it turns out i only moved in one property i didn't move in any of the other seven properties that i had into this um and then what they did is they formed me an s corporation and then to capitalize the s corporation they moved in my car and they moved in one of my pieces of real estate into it and i was like holy smokes i can't imagine how much worse this could have done like um, what the quality of this advice was and so he's like i know i know i know i was like hey listen don't worry you know we're going to be able to uh to look at that and be able to do that but you know that's a common story i get is that people um will have do inappropriate moves especially as moving real estate inside of s corporations and i was wondering if you could share with us a little bit about um why is that so bad and what do people do if they find themselves in that situation yeah that's a uh... Uh, unfortunately, somewhat common mistake um, that we see. So yeah, I think the, the two most common mistakes, one is uh, like what you said earlier, you know, people have the LLCs, but the properties are not moved in. Uh, I'm doing, you know, at the end of the year, every year, uh, we, we contact clients and say, hey, tell me all of new entities that, that you formed or dissolved this year, if you haven't told me already. And this is where we get, hey, I formed ABC Holding Company. Of course, the follow-up question is, well, what does it do? What does it hold? Well, it was supposed to hold this property, but it's not doing that yet, right? So then we kind of go, okay, well, let's you know finish the process. Um, because if you just have an entity that's not holding your asset, then you know the LLC is not really providing protection for the property, right? You're still the owner. Um, on the S Corp side, uh, one of the downs, so, so one of the main reasons we don't suggest investors hold rentals in an S Corp, well, a couple of different reasons. One is that when you have to take title out of an S Corp into your individual name, uh, that's actually a taxable event, uh, which seems sort of ridiculous, but the IRS treats it as if you sold the property to yourself, 
from your S Corp at fair market value. So if I have a property that I bought for 100,000, it's now worth 150, I have to move it out into my personal name. There could be taxable gain of 50,000, even though I've never sold, I'm just simply moving it. And so the question becomes, well, why would I do that? Why would I move into my personal name? Um, most common reasons we see would be financing. You know, sometimes the banks don't want to finance inside of an S corporation. So they'll force the owner to take it out in the personal name, refinance, and then maybe you can put it back. Uh, so that creates, you know, a somewhat significant problem if you have highly appreciated assets. We're talking about 50,000, but it could be a 500,000 appreciation. Um, and that becomes a very painful process to do. So, um, uh, you know, one of the things is, you know, I said, I do sometimes see clients that are, you know, have properties in there from years and years ago. And so it's a difficult decision to make and say, okay, how, you know, do we want to unwind this and have that exposure um, of potentially having, you know, a significant amount of taxes that are due. Um, the other reason, major, major reason that we don't like S corporations is that there, there's what we consider basis issues when property is held inside of an S corp. So, um, you know, if you hold real estate in S Corp that has leverage, okay, and, and you know, most real estate investors have leverage, um, to the extent that you have a, a huge loss from depreciation and things like that, personally, you might not be able to utilize that um, leverage loss uh, because it doesn't give you basis as a shareholder. And so what happens is, you know, you got someone owning like a, you know, an apartment building, if it's in an S Corporation, it's creating this, you know, $50,000, $100,000 loss looks great on the K-1, but when it's time to prepare your personal returns, there sometimes is a limitation where of that $100,000 loss, maybe you can only use 10, 20, or 30,000 of it because part of that was the result of leverage. Um, and so those are two you know, very um, important reasons why we don't hold real estate and really all you know, most appreciating assets. We don't want to hold them inside of an S corporation. Um, those two problems I just mentioned do not exist in LLCs, do not exist in partnerships. So we have highly leveraged real estate in a partnership picking off losses. The individuals can utilize that. Um, it doesn't give us any basis issues. And then on the refinancing, you know, if you have a rental in your personal name, move it to the LLC, move it out in the personal name. You can do that every single month if you want to refinance. You're chasing that low interest rate. Um, not ever going to be a tax problem. Oh, awesome. Yeah, so like the the, nuts, the story at the end of the day is like, hey, if you're inside of the S corporation, then we have to make some tough calls uh, about what, what's going on uh, and how can we possibly move that asset um, out or what, what are we going to do? Maybe we have to sell it and then try to figure out what we're going to do because like, hey, that's just a bad place for you to be holding money. Is that the kind of decisions people end up with? Yeah, and exactly. Like, so yeah, it's, I mean, I mean, and also, you know, sometimes it's quick to, to rectify the situation. I don't know this particular client um, you're talking about. So if it's something that just happened, right? So uh, it was worth a hundred thousand. I moved it in, talked to Scott, realized it was wrong. You can probably move it out right away because odds are it didn't appreciate yet, right? It just, you know, maybe it appreciated by $5,000. So who cares? And you can always contact appraisers to get the lowest appraised value when you move it out. So you're paying as little taxes as possible. Um, there is something in the proposal. This is a, a very hopeful change if it comes up uh, that's currently being discussed is that they're wanting uh, to, uh, so they would allow S corporations to convert into LLCs or partnerships without a tax issue. So sometimes, you know, you hear investor or CPA say, oh yeah, I just changed my S corp to an LLC. Well, when you do that, it's still treated as a taxable distribution. Um, and so one of the proposed changes that, you know, still being voted on or decided on right now is they're wanting to say, well, for S corporations formed before 1996, I think it's 1996 and earlier uh, that you can convert that to an, uh, an LLC and not uh, be subject to, you know, recognizing gains. So we're very hopeful that that passes because it's super beneficial for investors who've made mistakes years and years ago. You can imagine what those properties cost that you bought in 1996. Um, so we're really hoping that that uh, gets changed. So, yeah, I mean, it'd be fantastic if they can uh, do some things to be able to help us out with some of those taxes. Um, coming through, you know, yeah. I do it. Um, so that's awesome. So I think we cover it off on just about everything S corporation related. Um, I wanted to give you an opportunity here to Amanda too, because I know that you just recently um, did a presentation here on like what are the proposed legislation um, coming through, and I think that also had to impact um, something, some things to do with like retirement account investing with inside of real estate as well too, right? Is that something you want to take sixty seconds and kind of and brief on and kind of tease out where everybody should 
um, join in for your your resource and presentation that's more about those proposed legislative changes yes of course yeah um definitely if any of you guys are interested in what the proposed regulations are check out our website it's www.keystonecpa.com um where i think we spend like 30 40 minutes talking about what the proposed changes are and there are a lot of them but uh, as real estate investors, um, I know a lot of you guys are doing self-directed investing, um, something near and dear to my heart because I also use self-directed investing into real estate, right? My IRAs, my 401ks. One of the things that they're looking to eliminate um, is our ability to self-direct into different types of funds. So you think private equity syndications, apartment syndications, commercial <laughs> syndications. Um, and I know a lot of investors do that. Um, and so what they're wanting to do is essentially take away the ability for a self-directed account to invest in anything that requires the investor to be accredited, right, based on net worth and income. And again, that's most syndication deals, you know, most of these special deals that like a family office client would invest in, a lot of those could be prohibited. Um, this is not law yet, it's something in the proposal. And so what we're asking everyone and all of you here um, is to contact your congressman, tell them to vote against it. Um, you can check out our website, uh, keystonecpa.com. I think it's for slash act now or something. I'm sorry, I don't even know my own website URL. Uh, but anyway, I have some resources, sample letters. You can write to your congressman, email them uh, to try to get this passed. This is somewhat retroactive, meaning if you already have investments in self-directed accounts in a syndication, as an example, um, you effectively have about two years to unwind that transaction, uh, thereafter potentially subject to taxes and penalties, which is uh, very, very problematic. Yeah. Okay, so I asked uh, Tammy to go ahead and stop uh, the presentation here today. There's about another 15 minutes of time that we have uh, there with Amanda on the recorded video. We're going to have that inside of our Facebook group as well as our podcast. That talk that we had just went a little bit longer than we're typically uh, like accustomed to uh, for the show format because we just got caught in having such a great conversation with that. So but we're going to have the show post up uh, on the podcast as well as the uh, inside of the Facebook group. Um, and so, Tammy, if you can go ahead and drop those links in for everybody um, so that everybody can go ahead and grab um, grab those links to be able to hear the rest of the valuable information that Amanda was sharing there. Um, and Amanda, I want to go ahead and, and turn the um, mic over to you. Are you still good to um, uh, stick, stick around for the next 13 minutes, Amanda or Matt? Uh, yeah, can you hear us? Yeah, we got gotcha. you. Perfect. Okay, there we go. Um, so I think that there's, I think you guys have probably been looking at some of the stuff that was here in the chat and then judging from the conversations that were happening at the very beginning of the call today, um, it looked like to me that a lot of the questions that people have are around like the real estate professional, uh, conversation, um, especially around like, Hey, if you're a W2 or not W2, um, yeah, covering off on that question seemed to be uh, one of our uh, top issues of the group. I think this other question about like, how do you select the right CPA is it would be another great thing to cover off on and just underscore because first we got to know who we're going to have inside of our circle of influence, right? And, and then also, okay, what are the tactical things we can do? Um, so maybe we can cover off on those two. And then if there's other questions that you've seen from here in the chat or that you believe would be pertinent to cover off on, we can cover on those as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sounds good. So I was actually in the breakout room with uh, was it Morty, Andy, and uh, Kirsten. So, <laughs> um, so I think to rephrase the original question uh, was, you know, if you self manage your rental properties, do you automatically get to use the losses, or are you still concerned with real estate professional status? Uh, I believe that was kind of the gist of the the first question, um, and the answer, unfortunately, is yes. So just because you actively manage your own rentals does not mean that you can automatically use it to offset all types of income. The IRS still requires that you meet real estate professional status. So as unfair of a, of a, you know, a rule as that is, that unfortunately is the current rule. And so what does that mean for someone who is working full time? Uh, you need to have more time in real estate than your job. And that's what trips up most people if both, you know, if you're single, you have a full time or both spouses are working at a full time job because, you know, full time usually defined as 2000 hours a year. So if you're working 2000 hours a year to be a real estate professional, you have to have more than 2000 hours a year uh, to be able to use your rental losses. Now, uh, not impossible, but uh, we very rarely see someone to be able to meet that requirement. Um, 
And I think uh, so uh, Andy also had uh, uh, mentioned, at least in the breakout group, that uh, all you guys do is wholesale. And so um, if you don't own rental properties, yes, you're spending more time in real estate than your other job, right? Because maybe you don't have another job. All you're doing is, is active real estate. Um, it doesn't really make a difference whether you are real estate professional or not, because real estate professional simply means that you can use your rental losses to offset taxes from your wholesale or flip or W-2 income. Uh, Cause I, I think I heard you mention like, oh, I do a lot of real estate, that's all I do, but I don't really spend time in rentals or I don't have rentals cause all I'm doing is flipping. So if you don't own rentals, then um, real estate professional is not relevant to you at all because that specifically applies to someone's ability to use rental losses to offset flip or W-2 income. Um, now, one thing to consider, right, since you're flipping, that means you're coming across lots of deals or you're wholesaling, you're seeing deals all the time, consider holding on to some of those because if you can turn one of those deals or you know multiple ones into rentals, then you can start accumulating real estate, you know, rental hours, and then you can use rental losses like depreciation, bonus to then offset taxes from your wholesale or flip income. So hopefully that answers that question. That, that's awesome. And I want to just underscore that, Amanda, because Lisa just chimed in. She's like, well, if I just started my real estate in June, do I still have to do 750 hours for this year? Sounds like Lisa's wondering if she has to just basically put an IV a coffee yeah, and to be able to be able to make it as a real estate professional. Uh, yeah, for real estate professional, the requirement is uh, a minimum of 750 hours and more time in real estate than your job, uh, of which 500 of those is on, you know, uh, real estate properties you own. So the 750 for someone uh, like Andy, right, the 750 could include wholesale and rental and all kinds of real estate. But of that 750, at least 500 needs to be on rentals you own. And that's why it's important to actually own rentals, because if you don't own rentals, then it's hard to meet that second test for 500. And yeah, the the, the hours requirement is not prorated depending on when you got started during the year, unfortunately. Yeah. But something we kind of mentioned a little bit earlier, right, is, um, you know, for, for someone who's like, you know, has a W-2 job, don't plan on leaving anytime soon. Doing real estate, you know, probably won't qualify as real estate professional. Another option is to consider maybe short-term rentals, because if you're uh, investing in short-term rentals, you don't have to be a real estate professional to use those losses. You just have to meet material participation roles. Um, there's what seven ways to do it. Yeah. Um, but the two most common ones for material participation, one is that you spend at least 500 hours on the short-term rentals, okay? So if you meet that requirement, again, you can have 2,000 hours at your job. We don't really care. You can use the rental losses to offset W-2 and other income. Uh, the other one, the other common way to meet material participation is that you spend at least 100 hours on the short-term rentals and no one else spends more time than you. So you're looking at the cleaning crew, the landscaper, um, if you have property management, how many hours are they spending and you have to spend more time than they do. Uh, so for like, you know, year end, because we only have two months left, um, the short-term rental route might work for some people who are maybe on the cusp of closing on the property uh, because then you don't have to have that 500 hour requirement. Awesome. Yeah. I just want to underline for everybody from an attorney perspective at this, what I'm worried about is audit risks typically that come through. And when we're talking about audit risks, what we're typically looking at is do you typically, do you pass the smell test? Do you look like somebody who should qualify for this? And like in the general scheme of who qualifies. And if you're ever outside of that or have a question about that, and you're like, well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, da, 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 that's when you have to start doing thorough documentation. So if you're like trying to figure out, well, how do I push the limits of what this looks like? One is getting really clear what the rules are. Second is, is saying like, I'm going to have really thorough documentation in case I ever get audited. And that's what you are able to use to fight back audits. Uh, but your best case, in, your best thing is in here is to be, um, as to be really careful with what you're going to try to claim. If you're too aggressive, you'll get flagged and they have AI and other types of systems they use for that kind of stuff. So you're going to want to be really careful on um, that and have really expert advice as you're going through trying to determine like how, how aggressive or conservative you want to be with your tax strategy and that. Yeah. And I actually also heard in the breakout room earlier, someone mentioned that, you know, when they were using TurboTax or some kind of software, uh, where if you tell them you manage the property, then it allows you to be a real estate professional status. So one caveat I would say is the software is only as good as the user. So if you're not answering questions correctly, uh, the software might allow you to use a loss, 
even though you don't actually meet all of the requirements. Again, for people who are, you know, W-2 or, or have, you know, uh, different businesses, the goal to beat is your hours at your job or the hour in your other business, uh, like what Charlie was talking about. Yeah, because if you get audited, you can't you can't claim um, TurboTax ignorance. <laughs> TurboTax made me do it. <laughs> Not a defense. No, yeah. it's not a defense. <laughs> um, I'll just, since we're talking about TurboTax, you know, someone asked, like, how do you find a good CPA? Uh, someone asked about CPA locally in Texas. So um, I think, you know, a couple of things. If you are someone who invests nationally, so meaning you might live in Texas, you have rentals out of state, uh, make sure you work with a firm that does work with investors that are out of state, because we see that a lot, right? People live one place, but invest in other cities. So they need to be well-versed in multi-state taxation. Um, I think if you ask CPAs, most of them will tell you they do real estate, you know, they have real estate clients, maybe, you know, they might own one rental or two rentals. Uh, but I think just extend the conversation more, you know, as real estate investors, I think we kind of have our own lingo, you know, the birth strategies, wraparound, seller finance, uh, wholesale. So continue the conversation and get a, that'll give you an idea of how much they actually know about real estate, right? Because if they're looking at you like, not really sure what you're talking about in terms of a lot of these lingo that are used, then that's a sign that they might not be, you know, uh, the appropriate advisor if you have to explain even the transactions to them, right? Uh, but yeah, I would definitely just spend the time to interview uh, beyond the, you know, do you have real estate clients? Because you already know the answer to that. <laughs> uh, I can chime into that too, as well, too. It's like something that I'll use when I'm using any professional that I'm working with is a tactic like asking them like, Hey, where do you fall? Like, where do you consider yourself on like the spectrum of where do you give advice? Like, are you a, are you a white hat guy, which is it's always the most conservative position I could possibly take in here. Or are you actually like a black hat? Like I'm comfortable doing stuff that's illegal. Like, I don't care, you know, <laughs> and what you, and typically where you find the sweet spot is not at like the total white hat. You want the person that says, great. Well, if we can, if we have the right conditions, then we can claim these types of tax advantages. And that's actually what strategic tax advice is. It's like, let's change the facts about what we're doing here and how we're operating to get us into the right position. But we're going to take the aggressive position that we can actually defend if we get audited, right? And that actually requires somebody with deep levels of expertise, um, not on just in their field of tax, but also in the type of assets, because it, it takes both things if you're trying to accomplish net worth. It's not just the tax, it's the tax plus the assets. And if you have a professional that's aligned with actually making money the same way you make money and that they think that way, that's how I found to be able to get the best bang for the buck out of professionals that I hire. So fair to say, Amanda, not to step on toes or anything, but yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's it is right. You're we're, uh, the tax planning and even the legal planning. It's about changing your facts, right? We're not trying to change the law. The law is the law, uh, but we're trying to change our facts so we fit into what's most beneficial under the law. Yeah, and there's best practices of the other investors that have already come before you. Right. So when you're working with firms that are like uh, Matt's and Amanda's or mine, it's a reason that why we specialize in real estate investors, because we're crowdsourcing. Here's all of the best practices that come up. So when it comes up for us, it's not like we're trying to create something. We're like, no, there's 20 other guys that are way smarter than us and have way more assets than us that have actually come through our door that we've like worked with on like, how do we do this? And we're just going to do the same thing for you because it's advantageous for you. Yeah. I'm, think- laughing. I'm laughing because I think from an advisor perspective, people ask that question that we can turn it around and say, well, yeah, we're more in that, that middle of the white, white hat area, but all of a sudden that person, the black hat wants to do everything illegally. That, that tells you, that gives you a good indication of <laughs> who, you, who you may or may not want to work with. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. If somebody comes in and says, Hey, I want to be black hat. I'm like, that's cool. You should go somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And I think a good question too, when you're interviewing, um, you know, CPA specifically for our tax uh, advisors is uh, ask them, you know, what are your successful real estate investors doing transactionally? You know, where are you seeing good cash flow or profits made? Uh, and what are uh, some good strategies that your current clients are using, right? Again, it's it's beyond the, do you have real estate investor clients? It's getting more into, you know, what are their other clients doing? And hopefully, you know, they're not struggling to come up with a question about, what are some of the strategies or where they're seeing money being made in real estate if they actually do have a lot of real estate clients?